Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another week of Blastcast. I am Jarus with me, of course, as always, is the common loot box drop co-host, Lightning Dragon. I have way too many of them. And we just keep coming up with more. Indeed. All right, of course, uh, this week on Around the Verse, I talked about uh, Quantum Drive and all the effects and things on that. Uh, that's kind of interesting, because we just got done talking about that a couple weeks ago. Uh, but... Um, yeah, yeah, geez, CIG, get on our level. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't exactly thinking that, but we'll go with that. <laughs> yeah, but not too much there to report on. Uh, you know, we're still kind of in a content drought. I don't know if it's if they're holding off for the, um, for you know, for for some sort of a massive sale coming up, or if they're holding off for uh, waiting for 3.0 to come out. But I'm surprised we haven't been seeing more have, of a. Haven't deluge. you heard the news though? 3.0 hmm. is a big fat lie. Man, I'm gonna. I I don't know what to say. All the times I've been logging into it, I, I just. <laughs> I, I don't. Yeah, uh, apparently it's a big, huge like pyramid scheme or something. Oh, oh yeah. Oh. Yeah, and and you guys just need to keep your money and run. Some of those mountains I saw seem to be pyramid kind of pyramid <laughs> size. Maybe that's what that that be. That's what that no, is. No, 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 no. They're, they're upside down pyramids. Oh, okay. That's what a pyramid scheme is. Oh, okay. Oh, because yeah. it's totally impossible to make an upside down pyramid. If you're good at balancing, you'd probably do it. <laughs> Whatever. Anyway. <laughs> All right. Now, let's just go ahead and kind of get into it. Now, there was a video posted on the forums uh, from the Nubifier talking about uh, an interview with John Pritchett dealing with the physics of flight, and especially when it comes to atmospheric. Now, I like to say that looking at this, uh, this general thoughts going on in the forums, you have some people who think that it's completely... Uh, would be completely normal or natural to have vehicles that could basically put their nose straight down and hover without really much in the way of retro thrusters to uh, just kind of just, it kind of park there. You're just kind of like you don't even really barely even wiggle. Um, to me, it seems that we're missing a golden opportunity here to not only make a more understandable flight model when it comes to atmosphere, but to make it much easier for people to land. You see people landing all the time, they just smash the deck and whatnot. And if you're out there on planets, you're not always going to be landing on a place where you can just hold down the end button and auto land. So you're going to have to be a lot more precise or a lot more in control of your descent. So what they need to do, in my opinion, and this is once again just the opinion factory, um, they need to have, so you can have two different modes. We've already got modes up in yin yang, yes I know, but it just goes to show that they can go ahead and implement a mode, and it's not like they have to reinvent the wheel here. But well, they need to. Hmm. If if this is the mode you're talking about, when you enter the atmosphere, mm -hmm. based on your ship, it just automatically turns into this. It's not something you toggle. Well, I mean, to a degree, it depends on what ship. But yeah, I mean, you just get rid of you get rid of one kind of mode because, like, if you're in an atmosphere, uh, I, what 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 we're talking about here is you have your standard forward flight mode and you have a VTOL mode. Think of it like switching over to like a Harrier. And when you do that, your throttle controls your vertical, much like you would in a helicopter or a Harrier. And your left and right, as you pitch, slides the ship. You can still have power to your thrusters, which will do a, a, a smoother left and right shift and forward and back. But as a planet gets heavier, more power has to be pushed into the uh, thrusters that are keeping you aloft reducing the amount of maneuverability you have uh, in the ship moving in all those different directions also increasing the recovery time say of you know if you pitch hard to the right and you're in a plant with say 1.5 G's uh, it would it, it would be a much more sluggish response than if you were something say had 0.75 G or something like that so a lighter planet would allow greater uh, well lesser required resources to stay aloft allowing you to go ahead and shunt more of those powers to the thrusters in other directions. Now, of course, uh, vehicles with airlift surfaces, now this is, of course, assuming that we have an atmosphere here. If there's no atmosphere, everything's just going to be VTOL for the most part once you get into gravity. But if it has an atmosphere, ships, for example, like the Hornet and the Sabre and things like that, would have the option to go ahead and just do a standard flight model, uh, forward-based and whatnot, and but large ships like an airplane like or an airplane. something 
And uh, large ships that come down, like the Caterpillar or Starfarer, once their forward momentum is not going to be sufficient, once gravity is greater than their forward momentum is going to allow for, the ship will begin to shift into a pure VTOL mode. And after that point in time, it handles like a helicopter would. Now, And speaking hmm. of the Caterpillar, that's a yeah. very flat, blunt front end. So that would have an insane amount of drag. It'd be really hard to fly that thing at any high speeds. True. A VTOL, VTOL mode would be much more efficient for a design like that. And uh, so what this also allows, when I talk about the smooth landings, is that once you're over the surface, all you need to do to land smoothly besides find a place that doesn't have jagged boulders sticking out everywhere or things like that, you find a reasonable landing space, is you simply... Eject button. <laughs> eject button. <laughs> I guess it, get, it does get you down eventually. Uh, no, but the... Um, you know, I've actually always wondered if they're going to implement parachutes. That's another. That's another. Subject. That's a totally different story. Than not true. for this one. <laughs> yeah, you got me off a tangent there. No. So all you do is, if you're at just enough thrust to maintain your current lift, all you have to do to land is simply power back the throttle just a little bit, and that's going to let your gravity is going to do the rest, and you'll go down. You'll go down smooth. Uh, a lot of times when you see them doing the the videos and when they land on planets, what you see is they come down very sharply. Um, and that's because at a neutral position, uh, you have to force the ship down. You just can't power down uh, the engines and the ship drops. It's not the way it works because there is no such thing as VTOL mode. And they have to kind of like, every, all the thrusters are set to, if you're not touching anything, it just it just hovers there. It's counterintuitive. And if any of you, you out there... You mean it's kind of like gravity doesn't exist when you're on the planet? Well, I mean, if you watch the uh, the Gamescom demonstration, you could see all the things we're talking about. In fact, even the uh, the uh, not only that when people were playing it on the videos of, of the, of the uh, streams in the days prior, but when you watch the demonstration at Gamescom, uh, how the ships basically look like. Well, for the most part, they're flying more like UFOs than actually aircraft, and they definitely didn't hold to the aesthetic or the the, the flight motif that you would see for a helicopter or a Harrier or such, and. So, when I saw that video from the Nubifier, I was like a little dismayed that the, the, along the, the statement that things are really close to where they need to be because, frankly, they're not. And I, I get the idea of hand wavium and all that stuff, but you know, you can hand wavium a lot of things. I could hand wavium that my pocket phone becomes a comes megazord and freaking take over the world with it. You know, at some point in time, you have to let you, people. You mentioned that, and I s kid you not. Not like an hour before we started recording, I heard a song that reminded me of the Power Rangers theme, so I had to go and watch the freaking Power Rangers theme, because it's like, that sounds so familiar, but it, that wasn't what the song was. <laughs> I have that ability. <laughs> it's, just, it's just creepy. It's like, but you, you know. I do know. <laughs> the cameras that cameras I've hidden in your room tell me all. <laughs> and apparently speakers, too. Exactly. Well, at least microphone. So speakers would give me away. But, right. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> moving along, moving along. Part of the thing about flight simulation or car simulation or simulations of any kind, that reminds me we have a video coming out later this week that uh, you'll get to see a not Star Citizen related, but it's going to be fun. It's going to be uh, something that my brother, Lightning Dragon, and I did together, and I think you might enjoy seeing this game. But but it's a simu any simulation environment, The one of the main factors is feeling like you're in control of the vehicle and that there is a challenge to controlling the vehicle. And when you automate too much, now we, we talk about Pritchett's work and he does a great job, but the IFCS system kind of like takes all the great physics information and all the stuff in there that would make the game feel really great and then automates it almost against it so that it negates it. So it's like, you have a plus one over here and a minus one over there and you end up with zero. So it's one of those things that they need to give us that some of that personal control back so we have a feeling of flying, which honestly I don't feel that we have at this point in time. It's kind of like playing Gran Turismo or Forza and you know when you're out there racing you want to be able to feel to an extent through the way that the game is projecting the game to you that you're connected to your vehicle and how hard the turns are and things like that. You want to feel that rush. You want to feel like you're driving at the edge 
Lighting and I have been playing a lot of, uh, of Grid Autosport, uh, sometimes on the weekends or sometimes on the weekdays too, and and we've had races where it's just back and forth, and we, we keep swapping positions. It's just down to, you know, taking it that car to the edge of the, of the limit, but and not fucking up and crashing. <laughs> that too, that too. Uh, but you know, if you take away that visceral experience, if the cars pretty much just drove like they were on rails, like those old electric cars you would get there which were literally on rails and you just held on the trigger for the most part that's you lose you lose something I, in the transition i owned one of those when i was a kid <laughs> yeah, they're fun for a time like, you know but we had one i we had one too but i never i never got into it so that's what i feel is disconnected and also as well having a vtol model will blend much better with the ground vehicles uh the ground vehicles drive are limited in in their mobility and with the way the ships fly, as you saw in the Gamescom presentation, they had to miss that Ursa rover on purpose. If this had been a live game demonstration with interactive mode, which also needs Pinpoint to go to make this work. accuracy! Yeah, well, that's another thing would have to go to make this work, because you could just still point your guns wherever you wanted to, and it negates the purpose, but... I'm going to click the start bar on my desktop. Oh, <laughs> I've destroyed the Ursa rover. Exactly. Wait a minute, those are the same thing. So, you know, it's one of those things that if you were in a VTOL mode, if any of you out there who played a helicopter or Harrier or even Grand Theft Auto V know how difficult it can be to hit a ground vehicle uh, when you're in VTOL. It takes practice. It takes real skill. You have to monitor your pitch. You have to monitor your, your uh, how much thrust you're putting in, how much lift, everything. It's, it's, and as you're playing in an airplane trying to do strafing, uh, it's even harder. <laughs> yeah, it can be, because you have less of a window. And you have to make a big enough sweeping pass. So what this means for the ground vehicles is that they have a chance to position themselves uh, accordingly, to take cover or to uh, make it as difficult as possible for the target attacking them to actually hit them. And with the system they have right now, as I said, you could just point your nose straight down you know, oh, I'm going to point my nose straight down that Ursa rover, and I'm just going to side strafe, and there's nothing he can do about it. The nature of the game has to be such that the flight model matches the design decisions. See, right now, the only way that an Ursa rover or anything like that is going to survive on a planet dealing with ships is if it was a Tron light cycle. Because that's the only way it would have the maneuverability needed to get away from anything attacking it from the air. Don't forget the, uh, the light barrier thing, so if you were falling too closely the, the light barrier extends all the way to the atmosphere and you'd crash into it and explode instantly. <laughs> that would be a mechanic. Actually, I'd like to, I'd like to see that someday. The, not, <laughs> not, not, not a star citizen, but I'd like to see someone take a... <laughs> I'm just picturing that right now. You know what? That's probably how they defeated that uh, cutlass that was falling on me. It hit their light barrier. Yeah, exactly. That. We just it didn't just see it. Visible light invisible light barrier. <laughs> So yeah, that's our general thoughts on that, and it's no, there's no critique on 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 really on any on the Nubify or his video. Just the general thought process that goes into this seems to be a little bit of a disconnect between the whole. And if any point in time they think that parking your ship nose down and being able to just to sit there is not going to cause problems with the ground vehicles or people on the ground, I want to take cover behind. Yeah. Especially when they're doing it in ships that are modeled after fighter planes. Right. They have well, I mean, wings, they have stabilizers. Exactly. It's just, and then it's just, oh, I'm just going to park here and, and hover like I'm an anti gravity ship. Yeah, there, there, there'll be no point in time that you can take cover behind anything. Oh, I'm going to take cover behind this rock, and he hovers directly above you with his nose pointed down and shoots you. If you have ships that can just fly around like bumblebees or whatever, why do you even have pilots in them in the first place? I mean, they're basically they're unmanned drones. They have enough thrust to murder the, anyone that would fly them, uh, if, if they were based in a, in a real physics setting, uh, and and they can point straight down. So clearly, they would not even look like what Star Citizen is because the main engine would just, be, you know, you'd have one in the front or you know one and a half on the front, you know, in front like either side of the cockpit. You have one in the back. You have some on maybe they're on gimbals and they're rotating on the sides. Your ship would just be a bunch of engines on gimbal mount so it can thrust in every single direction equally 
You, there, there, there is no thrusters in Star Citizen. Yeah, Unless that's the only factor is the large engines are right. for the quantum drive. Well, that's what I kept saying. You know, it's, normally it's form follows function, but they created the form first. That means now they're stuck with the function. And if they wanted, to, if they had intended for the game to fly like you know your ship was a sphere with with you know different thrusters uh, stuck out, stuck in the sphere, so you look like a uh, the remote that Luke fights in the original Star Wars. Then <laughs> they should have designed it that you know that if that's the way they wanted the, the the engine to fly, then they should have designed the ships like that. But can't see anything with the blast shell down. You know, the pacing has to match the the form, the function, the pacing. All of it has to go together. And so I just thought I would address that. So let's this is going to be kind of a hybrid episode because there was not that many questions this week, just a lot of uh, general comments and thoughts and things like that, but no real questions a per se. Show. Well, that but, sounds so like a perfect doing, segue. Hmm? That sounds like a perfect segue. It is a for, segue. For the tea that I got to drink so that oh. I'm not coughing all the time is, I don't know what was made with it, but it's really awful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there you go. There's your segue. That, that is, that, I guess. <laughs> okay, so what we're doing is uh, we're going to answer one of the questions like we do in Citizen's Corner. And... Uh, kind of a general comments that kind of kept coming up and I think they're kind of uh, it's something that I wanted to clarify so let's start with a uh, start and finish with Dracalicious friends and groups could just all use a single ship and or run in fleets even the smaller ships like the Caterpillar would be a fine and perfect for multi-crew but I'm already seeing the same problems in the Star Citizen community as was in Space Engineers community I hope Star Citizen doesn't suffer the same fate well, and that's that's part of the thing, you know, flight should be difficult, it should be challenging. With enough difficulty, as stated when Chris Roberts wanted to have the game be as difficult as Dark Souls, as he kind of put it, uh, I guess he exactly put it. Yeah, unfortunately I'm terrible at Dark Souls. You know, it would be like one of those things that you would be happy to serve on someone else's ship because maybe you just, maybe you're not as good as a pilot as someone else, or maybe, you know, uh... You just want to go ahead and make some money for your next ship without without having to uh, risk your own. But you're right. I mean, a lot of times these large ships, like you, we play Space Engineers, so we definitely understand you can make a ship the size of a mountain and it just has one seat at the top that controls <laughs> it all. <laughs> the, the one seat to rule them all. <laughs> and, and, and that's also coming down to automation. Automation on turrets. Um, you know, the fact that you can, as a pilot... Uh, control four axes of control at the same time as you're controlling uh, your where your weapons are pointing basically only with one mode it, it, it simplifies the whole process down to not really needing other people and that's counterintuitive to the whole design of the multi crew ship and with the pacing being as high as it's become and of course it's, it's been higher but uh, you know with like 1.3 but with pacing being what it is and the complexities and annoyances that are going to come with manual turret operation, you're going to see people automating those turrets. And once again, as I said, instead of having, like for the Starfarer, uh, having you know a pilot and a uh, operator next to him and three turret gunners, you're going to have basically just a pilot and the operator. And you're going to have like, two more Starfarers out next to them with fully automated you know, weaponry. Uh, changes the scenario quite a lot for any attacking forces. Uh, or, re- or if you can go like, to the most extreme one, the Retaliator. There, we brought it in. Um, <laughs> you have the pilot with... Without mentioning the Retaliator. <laughs> you go um, pilot with five automated turrets instead of a pilot and five gunners. What you end up with in that particular case is you can have side-by-side six Retaliators. And obviously the complexity of any attacking craft dealing with that goes way up as well. So it throws the balance out of whack for uh, the attackers as well uh, obviously as... Obviously it's more expensive to yeah. run six ships as opposed to one, but the... But the firepower... The multipli- yeah, the, the firepower multiplier is, is way higher than, you know, like a times six. I mean, you're, you're probably looking at like times 20 or, or even greater the amount of firepower because... Well, the amount of coverage not- from the guns. I mean, the, the amount of... Well, spe- yeah. yeah. Like, not only are you basically getting six times the amount of guns, but you're also getting six times the amount of shields and armor. Yeah. 
I mean, people can angle to protect other people through, through you know, or whatever. The yeah. point is, is that you're dealing with a whole different ball game. And you know, you're right. They they need to make it complex enough that you know, like we played um, Interstellar Rift. Thank you. I don't know why names always fall on my head when it comes. So I, well, that's <laughs> which, why I, I have 300 they, they games on had... Steam. I mean, so Interstellar Rift. Okay, now that game is a great example of. Uh, taking a space engineer's kind of environment, but having an advantage to having multiple people because... Oh, it's huge. Yeah, I mean, because you have a guy in the captain's chair trying to fly to an asteroid and looking at a sensors while the guy down in the mining bay is waiting for uh, the the right ore to show up so he can mine it, and maybe you have some guy picking up the boxes and then trying to store them or arrange them. And, I mean, it, it's really... That game is really focused on the multi-crew and in fact, the more people you have consistently playing with you, the more interesting style of ships or the more uh, complex things you can do with your ships. And it really, really encourages that that kind of play. Not to mention that it has turrets that need to be manned. Exactly. So it's one of those things that uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, too much... If, if they go along the lines of simplifying things... It is going to be just a universe of captains and NPC with their NPC crews, and people aren't going to be flying inside other people's ship, uh, ships, and it's just going to be it's going to be missing that that special something. I think a lot of us signed up with for Star Citizen. All right, and just as a general note, I talked about um, we talked about bases being attacked, and how that we felt that there should be something similar to a war deck because of people having different times. And different lives. This was in the in the I think there was the last citizens corner, and there was a lot of disagreement on that. I totally get and understand that. The reason uh, most common suggestion was they just have AI hired to defend your bases when you're not around. The reason I'm not a big fan of that is is the totality of the solution is that I haven't played a single game yet that I haven't found a way to manipulate AI. Lightning is, can personally tell you how I uh, how I trained a very massive boss. Uh, around three three inches of three or three feet of steps, I'd, I'd literally step to the left. He'd run back down the steps and come up the other way. And I'd step to the right. He'd run back down the steps. He was coming up, come back the other way, and I just sat there just hopping back and forth and took this guy out. I think that was um wasn't that uh, in Star Wars: uh, The Old Republic? We have played so many MMOs oh, yeah. that yeah. I just I have no idea. Yeah. But something more recently when I was playing Warframe, you know those. Ultra Mega Sentinel dudes that they yeah. Borg adapt your weapons. Yeah, there, I was on this area where there was a, a gap into death. Basically, you, you'd fall to your death, but there were stairs that went down, and then there was a platform, and then there was where the gap was, and then you went uh, 180 degrees, and there were steps that went up. So it was kind of like a U shape, but with steps going down. And what I was doing is I was basically just jumping between the gap. And even though the thing I was fighting technically was flying or floating, it would go up the stairs. Then when I jumped over, it'd go down the stairs, across, and start coming back up. And I basically just sat there jumping back and forth for about two or three minutes trying to kill the stupid thing. It never touched me. It couldn't even do anything. So there's an example for you. And, and all I did was just jump back and forth. Right. AI make good supplements or supplementary defenses. Like, you would imagine if, if a enemy or rival organization comes in to attack you, they would probably have some of their own as well. But I've yet to really play against AI that's been spectacular, with the exception of one game. The original Fear had amazing AI. Um, it would flank you. It would outsmart you. I, I'd never seen AI as good as the original game of Fear. Uh, I... That one still just blows my mind how good the AI was there. But I believe it, I believe I said this in that video, but the way Imperion does it is if if you have offline protection on your base and you are not online, basically your base is taken out of the world. Like literally, no one can do anything about it. Now players have found ways to try and you know grief and cheese their way around it, but the devs are actively looking at that, going, "Wow, that's stupid. Let's see if we can fix this." But yeah. Empyrean's not really a PvP server, but the fact that they're actually looking into that and going, "Hmm, you know, we need to be able to have people not do that because it's ruining the fun of others." Well, uh, problem, it's not an ideal situation, yeah. but... Well, the problem with removing uh, the house or something like that is it, I think it breaks some of the persistence. Uh, maybe have the house there, but you can't, it, you know, can't, or can't interact. Or if you are going to remove it, you have to make sure that the area is, is marked in such a way that people can't... I believe the way it works is it like literally puts a big, huge shield bubble around it, and you can't okay. get close to it. 
Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, but they would have to come up with something. And it's not because, I, you know, once again, this isn't about trying to punish PvPers uh, or anything like that. It's because about I've protecting done... players. And their right. It's, it's 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 about you know you got you got people playing from all over the world on a game. And for example, you have some guy in Germany. Hey, maybe maybe their maybe their guild's prime time is like you know you're three a.m. And so you're just gotta you know it, it's gonna be one of those things that unless you can manage to get together and, and hash it out or figure something out, it just may not be. Uh, you know, maybe they'll have to subcontract out to another guild that can attack, you know, attack you for them. But there needs to be some sort of sense of protection, I think, to some degree, unless you want to, like, just sit and stare at the game all day, every day. You know, just afraid that someone's going to come in and take your stuff when you're offline. If, if there's not a way to protect your ships or your your bases or stations or anything that you own in an in an offline setting it'll just be anarchy yeah I mean, it, even it'd be a mess eve, i mean i know no one always agrees with eve we're not trying to make you know star <laughs> citizen eve but even a game like eve which is basically you can do whatever the hell you want has protections for this i mean they go through the war deck system but also like if you just start blasting people the cops show up yeah <laughs> Well, I said all that's still in development. We'll see what happens and all that. But I just wanted to clarify a little bit why I didn't mention AI. I know they're there. It's just that I've just found they're, they're too easy to exploit in most of the games I've played. It's just one of those things that a player with half a brain can find the pattern and can get around it. All right, and final note: um, loot boxes. Oh yes. Um, if I'm just mentioning this because of the... of the new Star Wars Battlefront. Yeah, gaming news. The year yeah. of the loot box, uh, the uh, Jim Sterling video. You should uh, check it out if well, you I, can I, tolerate listening to him. I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say this again. I can't say it's enough. Their game companies are getting ready to cross the line because it's a, it's going to take all it's going to take is one well placed person, one powerful individual who's got connections, whose son grabs his credit card and spends two thousand dollars in loot boxes, who's going to make a make them put out some some sort of law that says that this is gambling. And just wipe out the whole loot box experience across the board, um, in any way, shape, or possible. Because it, you know, oh well, we'll just sell with in-game currency. You can now buy in-game currency. So the, the, any any way around that is going to be dealt with. I really think that game companies are, are on the edge of pushing into uh, a major uh, legislation uh, thing sometime soon. The reason we're bringing this up is that uh, Star Citizen is going to be selling its money at a limited amount per day, which is fine because I think it cuts the uh, the gold farmers off at the knees, but um, down the road, I'm just saying that Star Citizen needs to avoid loot boxes like the plague. Because I only see this ending badly. For oh, I, I think people would have a riot. As, oh as yeah, well yeah, you, you, you put thousands of dollars is. in. Yeah. <laughs> not, you put thousands here, of dollars you, in the game. You have to loot box new, uh, new things. That would that would that would piss uh, me off. Loot box this gun type. Oh, it's a super rare gun type. It has a point zero zero yeah. percent chance of the opening in our ultimate platinum loot box. I mentioned only twenty nine ninety nine per <laughs> box. By the way, key is sold separately. Now I mentioned it. Partially because as well. Remember how you can buy skins on certain ships and for weapons right now? Um, it doesn't take much to turn those skins into loot box items. So I'm just saying is that uh, I'm just wary of the whole loot box scenario. A lot of games that I've uh, played or used to play uh, have gone heavily into the loot box uh, arena. And I think it's a poison to the entire gaming industry. And it needs to be cut off at the knees so I don't mind games having microtransactions as long as you pay for exactly what you get, but the loot box thing—it's taking advantage of people's uh, a lot of people's gambling addictions, and I think it's just poison. So anyway, guys, I know that was a couple side thoughts and a little bit of a different episode, but and a dark ending. <laughs> a dark, dark ending where I talk about cutting people off with the knees. It's so, so brutal. It is. All right, guys. Well, leave your thoughts, your comments down below, and we will go ahead and get back with you. Said. There's not going to be a Citizens Corner this week. It's uh, not I have unless a, we have a lot of comments. Unless we have a lot of comments, that's true. That might be a last minute one. Uh, <laughs> but there is an extra cast, as I said, and look for that later, maybe Friday or so. It's going to take a little while to do some editing, and um, we will catch you next time. Bye bye. <laughs>